Hello, I'm still Andy Fandango, and a few weeks ago I started trying to write an 8-bit character-based action game, just like in the very early days of home computers. I'm using a BBC Micro, because it has a nice 1K character-based video mode. It also has a built-in assembler so I can easily create fast machine code programs. Now I've not written assembly language for many years, and I've spent the last few decades mollycoddled by high-level object-oriented languages and advanced development and debugging tools. Video game graphics have moved on a bit too, so using character-based graphics from the Teletext era is also incredibly restricting. I've only had a few weeks to do this, otherwise you guys will lose interest, so the question is, have I bitten off more than I can chew? In part one I did a bit of a shallow dive into assembly language and why it's important to the core workings of a computer. I also described in painful detail how I wrote some code to render a character based sprite on the screen, to move it and even animate it. This time I'm not going to go into the code in quite so much detail but focus on the steps I've taken to move towards a working game and the problems I've encountered along the way. I've decided to create the standard vertical space game. I know it's not very imaginative but I thought I should keep things simple for my first attempt. That means we'll control a spaceship at the bottom of the screen and enemy things will appear above us that we'll have to deal with in some way. As you'll see the plan for my game changed a bit as I went along. I like to think I used an agile programming approach. Hmm. To give the impression of moving through space I wanted to scroll things downwards towards the player. The player would then have to avoid or collect the things or maybe it would just work well as decoration, a nice graphic effect in itself. In order to do that I need two bits of code. The first is to draw the top line, the source of objects that I'm going to scroll down. The second part is the scroll itself. For the first part I use a little lookup table to provide a pattern and then just render a zero character at that point. The second part just iterates over every character on the screen and moves it down a line until it gets to the bottom line. Now this is quite a processor intensive approach and we'll come back to that later. I also want to render the spaceship at the bottom of the screen using the code we wrote in part 1. Every time we scroll the screen I need to clear the ship and redraw it, otherwise it'll scroll off the screen too. Now that kinda works, but it's not pretty. I've synchronised the render to the screen update timer as best I can but the spaceship still flickers, and that'll only get worse if I add more to the game. Now in more modern games on higher spec hardware you'd do something called double buffering. This is a technique where while you show one frame on the screen you render the next frame into memory off screen. When you get a video update signal you swap the frames by pointing the video hardware at the other frame. This means there's no flickering but it also means you need enough memory to store two frames and ideally enough processing speed to render a frame in the time frame of your video hardware. Now memory and speed are two things that we don't have a lot of on a standard 8-bit computer, but because I'm using a small character based display mode, I started thinking, oh. maybe I could have say three layers in memory and then maintain an aggregate of those layers on screen that I would update on every frame. So my idea was to have a fixed bottom layer, a scrolling middle layer and a top layer with moving game characters. In this way the scrolling layer is isolated from the top layer where the player is and the bottom layer could have a fixed background to give a sense of depth. The screen mode we're using is only 1K so we can probably spare 3K out of the remaining 25K we have available and process that data in reasonable time. If we were using one of the BBC's 20K graphics modes we just wouldn't have enough memory on a standard machine and manipulating 20K of data would probably take too long to be responsive. We need to point the rendering to the relevant layer and then have a new piece of code that renders the actual display screen by looking from top to bottom through the layers at each point until it finds a new character to display. This is my first working version. You can see we have dots of stars in the background, scrolling asterisks and a fixed and non-flickery spaceship. Because the scrolling layer is effectively isolated from the other layers we can also do something very similar to hardware scrolling. Hardware scrolling is where you move the contents of the screen by changing the address the video hardware uses as the display origin, and then just redrawing the edge. The BBC Micro uses this very effectively in a number of commercial games including Planetoid and Rocket Raid. I'm going to do something very similar in that I'll tell the code that combines the layers on screen to use a different start address for layer 2 on each frame. So now I don't have to move each character down a row to scroll. 
Also for this version, I'm going to add a bit of color. Now we can add some control to our player ship. I'll use the ZNX keys to move it left and right. The BBC's operating system ROM provides a routine known as Ausbyte that we can call from assembly language. We set a function identifier code in the A register and it returns data in X and Y. In this case we'll query if a key is pressed. This is all nicely documented in the advanced user guide. Now at this point we start to step into the first significant cowpat. We're using a basic program to contain our assembly language source code and that takes up memory. Once we assemble that source code, it becomes machine code that needs to be stored in memory. The basic program also uses variables that are stored in memory. So the more assembly language we write, the less space we have to put the machine code into. So we're going to have to start splitting this up into parts and then we'll bring it all back together in memory at the end. The first thing I'm going to do is take the sprite generation code out into a separate program and then we can just dump the graphics definition memory into file to pick it up later. I'm also adding an alien ship that I want to fly down the screen and the player will have to avoid or maybe shoot it. So I'll render the alien on the scrolling layer and see if the player is pressing the return key to fire a bullet up the screen. If the bullet and player collide, I'll beep for now. So this is a proof of concept just to see if it's going to work as a game idea. If it does work, we should have some of the main components for a working game. Here we see the second major cowpat. Yes, it kind of works, but it's not very playable and that's because of the nature of a character-based action game. As we can only move one character at a time, the motion is quite clunky if we have a low frame rate, and clunky is bad. But if you run it fast enough not to be clunky, then the characters move down the screen in half a second, which doesn't give you much time to react. So I'm going to have to rethink how I'm going to interact with enemies on the screen. My first thought is to use the explosion animation I created in part 1 to warn the player that something will appear there. It's like a wormhole opens and the alien comes through. It's a nice idea, but it still doesn't really work and deep down I know it's not right. Now I'm in a bit of a pickle. What can I do to make this playable? This is where I had a moment of what I can only describe as pure genius. I like the wormhole idea, so why not have a worm that comes out of it? A robot space worm from the future. It can move down the screen from side to side and the player can shoot bits out of it a bit like the old arcade game Centipede. Perhaps if you hit the head, the whole thing blows up. So I created another separate program as a proof of concept, still in assembly language. The worm has an age so it can appear to emerge from a single point and a length. It's drawn backwards from the head and, when you're drawing, if you hit the edge of the screen, you go up a row and back in the opposite direction. To colour it, I need to add a colour code character before the first worm character on each row. Here's an early version. I've changed some of the colours and the scrolling space stuff is less in your face now. That's partly to make the new random meteors more obvious. They're an extra hazard so you can't just sit in one place blasting the worm. Hmm. But, I do now need to add some collision detection for the player. Like this. At this stage, it's got a couple of bugs, but it's starting to look like something you could actually play. In order to make it into something recognisable as a game, I will have to keep a score and count lives or energy or some other life cycle measure. So now I'm going to write another separate piece of assembly language for that. I'll save the raw machine code to file to merge into the final game later, and record the entry points to call and addresses of where I'm storing values. The code itself will just show a line of text and substitute in decimal characters for the score and a single digit life count. I also want some sound effects that are slightly better than the standard hardware beep. The BBC operating system ROM again provides a call to Osword that allows me to access the sound commands amongst other things and I can use the ADSR envelopes to create something better than just a flat tone. I can do all this in another chunk of machine code and store it to disk. Now I have a few separate machine code components I need to bring together. This is a rough memory map of what I need to assemble in the final program. 
Because I'm a bit lazy, I'm going to use a basic program to bring it all together and run the outer game loop. The basic program will then call the inner game loop we already have in machine code. And this, for now, is my finished game. You get three lives, hitting a worm body part reduces its length, hitting the head kills it completely. The worms get bigger as you progress. You need to remember to avoid meteors because you can't shoot them. Now it's not perfect, the worm colouring gets messed up by other colour control characters from time to time. The collision detection is fundamentally correct, but because it's at a character level, it can seem a bit unfair sometimes when you're only one character out from a hit. And there's a bit of a bug with the explosion positioning sometimes. None of these seem like major issues to me right now, but that's possibly because I'm just relieved I managed to get something playable done, because believe me, two weeks ago, I wasn't so sure I'd make it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Andy Fandango and I'm going to the pub. Cheers!